Hello everyone, welcome to our session, the Demystifying Ungrading. Uh, this session is scheduled for 45 minutes. I've been promised that the uh, speakers today would love to have a Q&A as well, so you have an opportunity to ask questions. My name is Chris Babbitts. I teach in history, psychology, and intersectional gender studies. Um, so yeah, one of those interdisciplinary scholars. Our presenters today are Julie Lamara, who is a uh, assistant professor of practice who teaches within the Outdoor Product Design and Development Program. Also, Timothy Chenette, who is an associate professor of music and teaches music theory and oral skills at USU. Also, Sharon Lyman, one of my favorite learning specialists on campus. If you don't take advantage of the learning specialists, you're really missing out on a whole bunch of stuff. And Sharon, um, teaches uh, our Habits of Mind courses on learning, reading, and planning, and also with Dina Rivera Dondas, who is an assistant professor and teaches 20th and 21st century African American literature. Hi everyone, it is so great to see your faces here today after uh, kind of the last couple of years and we're not on a screen or looking into a hole of abyss on Zoom. So I'm so glad that you are here to talk about ungrading. We are the rebels, we do not grade. And we came to this because we participated in a learning circle in a few semesters ago, when was this? Fall, Fall. yep. Um, and we read on grading, uh, why rating students undermines learning and what to do about it from Susan D. Bloom. And it was a very eye-opening experience for the four of us. And we all four come from varying disciplines. So we are going to give you perspectives from implementing ungrading into our specific disciplines and hopefully uh, give you some tools and techniques that you can take and then revisit and revise for your own specific courses. So what is ungrading? you might ask. Well, it's less emphasis on grades and more on learning. There's a lot more feedback and options for revisions. And usually we, we play on a complete or incomplete scale. It is not a lazy way out. It actually entails a lot more cognizant work on our behalf, I think, to give that formative feedback. Um, it's really about allowing the student to take control of their learning. And the feedback affords the student to understand the nuances needed to succeed because then they're offered time to implement that feedback and also practice it. So I'm going to talk about this in my discipline and then we're going to kind of go through each of our little sections and then we'll have time for discussions. So who am I? I have been an educator for the last 13 years and the last six years here at USU. Um, my philosophical approach to learning and teaching is rooted in experiential learning and a very student-centered approach. Um, I decided to implement ungrading into the spring of 2022 in a sophomore level course spe specified for outdoor product majors. So that was OPDD 2420. 2D digital product design, and it had 40 students in it. So this course focuses on building foundational industry-specific skills. So who said we have to grade anyway, right? We have, put, have we put constraints on ourselves as educators that don't exist? Just because we've always done it this way doesn't really mean it's the best way or the only way to measure assessment and learning. I don't think so. I think some traditions are a little bit outdated and we can improve upon them. So over the past 13 years of teaching, I've seen countless students have anxiety about point deductions and I feel like they're nickel and diming me for every single point, but not really truly understanding where those point deductions came from and the learning and the application for that exercise. Um, we are lucky to be able to practice our craft within academic freedom and with rigor. So I decided that I was going to change it up a little bit. I was going to treat my classroom like a design firm. 
Because once a student reaches industry, they're no longer going to receive grades. They're only going to receive feedback. And either they adjust or they're left in the dust. So this process of ungrading involves rich feedback from me, the instructor, from their peers, from self-reflection of their own uh, projects and puts the onus on the student to implement it in their work, allowing the student to take charge of their learning and to purposefully do their work because they want to improve. Okay, so the assignments that I, I have like a no busy work policy. Every single assignment means something towards their final portfolio. I do a portfolio based um, end of assessment. I also have opinions on tests. We won't go into that today. Um, but each assignment builds towards their final. So they're constantly getting that feedback before they get to turn it in. And design works that way. It's an iterative approach. So this just kind of gives you a glimpse of kind of like the area in which I teach and I learn and I live, right? So this design thinking process, it's a nonlinear approach. So why am I teaching in such a linear fashion of a one and done adage of you've done the assignment, you didn't do well, you fail, move on. But if they fail, they can't move on. They, they can't scaffold into the next set of issues that come that will build upon each other. So what they really need, whoops, sorry, is to have an opportunity to fail forward um, to see what didn't work and to use that as a pivot point towards a clearer vision of their work and more clear outcomes. Which means I need to be very clear. This is one thing when you think about teaching reimagined or teaching in general is that if you don't have set clear expectations, how can you assume that your students are going to be kind of guessing what's coming next? So what I think is that communication is the key to success in any relationship that you have. Um, and it's really imperative that you set clear expectations um, from the very beginning. Because if that's not happening and they don't understand what ungrading is or why you're doing what they're doing or like where they're standing in the class um, and how they're advancing, just, it's not going to work. So I just kind of highlighted um, from my syllabus my assignment policy. So how are they going to be evaluated? You're going to get heavy critique and lots and lots and lots of feedback. Design is inherently critiqued, right? Um, they're going to be labeled as complete or incomplete based on that feedback. Um, they can redo their assignments as many times as they want as long as you know, they're kind of done by the end of the semester, right? Um, and I'm not going to be grading individual assignments, but instead asking questions and having dialogue and discussion with them based on what they turned in. Um, and this has to do a lot with them reflecting on their work and me giving them feedback and questions so that they can fully understand the integration of the concepts. Um, at the end of the semester, they do give themselves a grade. I can either, you know, agree or disagree with them, but they need to prove it. They need to substantiate it through evidence based on their track record throughout the course. Do they have a whole stack of incompletes that they never revisited and they just plop that in? They're like, I earned an A, I finished. Well, did you? Right? Or, hey, I really tried hard. I redid this assignment five times. It was some of the best work I've ever done. I think I deserve a B plus. And I'll be like, high five. Yes, you did. Maybe you deserved an A, actually. So I, I still reserve that right as an instructor to kind of scale it back based on evidence. I also let students know um, that if they have any sort of ill will or like ill feeling um, and anxiety, because you know, I mean, I have anxiety. Why shouldn't they have anxiety? I know so many students that get really worked up about, I need to get an A. I have to keep my scholarship. My parents are going to kill me. I need to get a job. I need to be the top of my class. Um, those type A personalities are going to exist and they are going to be filled with anxiety and it is our job to kind of squash that a little bit and say, hey, I know this feels really unnatural, but let me know if that ever occurs and we can talk through and I can let you know kind of in a discussion where you're at and how to proceed forward. 
Um, I really want to make sure that my students are mentally capable and ready for something as challenging as like taking away the foundation in which their whole ed educational system has been based up all upon their whole lives. So this is what it looks like in my class. This is an example of some student work. Um, and you can see off to the side over here, I've provided some feedback to the student. We, you can see we've gone back and forth a few times. And I highlighted one from the student down here. Here's my resubmission. Hopefully it fits in line with what you asked for. If not, just let me know and I'll try again. Like, that's awesome. No, it's great. You're done. Let's move on. Or, hey, maybe tweak it a little bit here. But it becomes more of that dialogue and discussion. And they're more open to receiving that feedback and critique because they want to keep moving and improving. Here's another one. This one has a lot more. This is not the, the, the version in which I critiqued um, to the ends of the earth. Um, but I just realized the bottom of the back view is still janky. I'll fix that. They, they pointed out their mistake before I get to point out their mistake. They wanted to improve because they wanted to be better. They wanted to get a job. They wanted to be competitive, not because they're nickel and diming me to get past. So one of the ways that this does succeed is through conversations right, and check-in points. Right now, I only have the final self-evaluation up here, but I do a uh, mid-semester check-in with them. That's much more extensive. Um, at the end of our presentation, we have a box folder to share with you. And there, you will, can find kind of some um, documents from all of us. And one of them is one of my, my mid-semester evaluation. But what's really important is that you read that evaluation and you uh, really lean into where they're at, what they're missing, and what anxieties they have so that you can follow up. Follow up is like the key indicator that you know, they see you as a human that's actually valuing them as another human being as well. So this final self-evaluation is not as intense as that midterm evaluation, and it's asking them to reflect on their work in reference to the idea objectives for the course, um, did they, do they feel like they completed the objectives and they're ready for the next phase in the major? They need this course to matriculate into the major, by the way. If they don't have this course, they can't actually get fully absorbed into our program. Did you miss any significant work? And is there anything you're particularly proud of? Um, and then what would you give yourself as a final grade? And then my caveat, and that's a, that's a discussion point. So, these are just some highlights from what students said about this method. Themes that occurred. I'm very proud of what I did. Um, I loved being able to do redo assignments. Um, I know that I did my best rather than just what I had to do. I love this part. Doing this is giving me confidence while putting together aspects for my final capstone because I know my work is of quality. I really appreciate when I get feedback and people just don't let my mediocre work slide. I really like this ungrading method. I think ungrading is a much more effective way to learn and actually progress to in what I'm trying to learn. This one um, was a lot more extensive. I kind of just pulled out the highlights. The greatest academic experiences I've ever had. Whew. Oh my gosh. Hey, I felt like I actually learned something um, rather than just doing what was necessary. And it put the learning back into the academic and creative environment. Um, I'm not going to say that every single one of them absolutely loved it. I did have one student. I didn't put her. I went back and forth on putting her uh, feedback in here. But she's like, I didn't like it at first. It really kind of pushed me out of my comfort zone. She's one of those anxiety-ridden balls of stress. Um, but in the end, she said it was a good experience, and it helped her grow and kind of prepare herself for her future. So I'm reimagining how I'm focusing on my feedback, on my assessment, and how I'm going to move forward in all of my design-based courses. I'm going to hand it over to Tim to talk about how he's implemented this in music. Hi, everybody. So like Julie, I'm in a creative discipline. But my classes are, in many ways, very different. Um, I teach the boring stuff within a creative discipline, um, music theory. So 
Um, so it's a very different kind of uh, atmosphere. I'm going to be talking about what I learned applying ungrading in a second year required music major course with an enrollment of about 40. And it's very much focused on technical skills within music. And I suspect that many of you identify with the contradictions of my job. So on the one hand, we're tour tool givers, right? A tool giver uh, encourages, hands students useful and interesting knowledge, doesn't pretend that that knowledge is complete, doesn't even always pretend that it's necessary, and then we watch as students integrate it into their own lives. On the other hand, we're gatekeepers, standing as a barrier in front of students as they advance, deciding who's worthy and who is not, which often comes down to pre-existing privileges. And I'll be honest, I love handing students tools, and I hate being the keeper of the gate. The first tenet of my teaching philosophy is my teaching uplifts every human being, um, which is pretty ambitious, but anyway. <laughs> but that's part of why ungrading appeals to me. But at the same time, there are aspects of my job that call for at least a certain kind of standards keeping. And I suspect that's one um, thing that many of us would be worried about in, in uh, applying an ungrading system. Uh, my courses are sequenced. There's a one, and then a two, and then a three, and you need certain skills as you move forward. And my classes are required for music majors because it's expected that they attain certain competencies in them. So I'll re share my reflections on this challenge. Is it possible to maintain the standards necessary in certain disciplines, required courses, and course sequences, while emphasizing my preferred role as an empowering tool giver? In my syllabus, I used an infographic to communicate about ungrading to my students. I really wanted to capture their attention and for them really to read this. And by the way, in that box folder that we're going to give you a QR code for later, I link not just to a PDF copy of this, but also to the Canva template that I used. So you can actually grab this, use it yourself, alter it however you want. The first and most important decision that let me preserve learning standards while lowering the focus on grades was to give up the false precision of letter grades. I believe that with every being of my heart, in favor of pass-fail. For every assignment, and here's an example, I determined and communicated to students exactly what would indicate that they have sufficiently demonstrated the relevant skill. Submissions that met that standard were marked complete. This policy is arguably generous to traditional C work because they're marked totally complete, even though they didn't get to what I consider a perfect score. Whatever that might mean, I don't believe perfection exists. But at the same time, it's also a heavy penalty on work that is not, doesn't meet that standard because it's marked wholly incomplete. So I allowed penalty-free resubmissions of virtually all incomplete assignments within one week of being graded. How did this work on Canvas? I chose five uh, co concepts relevant to the course, and I has designated each assignment to the category to which it was most relevant. As you can see, I made each of these categories worth 0% of the final grade on Canvas so that when visiting the Canvas gradebook, nobody saw a final grade calculated. Actually, I left that on, and it calculated an F for them. Oh. Don't do that. <laughs> that caused some anxiety for a while. Most of the gradebook looked like this, simply marking complete versus incomplete. And when students or I scrolled to the end of the gradebook, we'd just see the percentage of assignments marked complete within each category. So something like that. Here are the categories at the top, and then you've got 100% of that work complete. You've got 75% of it marked complete, et cetera. At the end of the semester, if students had at least 75% complete work in every course category, every single one, they were allowed to name their own grade. And of course, that percentage could be adjusted to meet the needs of your field, or maybe you know, one category has to be at a higher level than another, or something like that. But this is what worked for me. Note that 75% doesn't necessarily correspond with a C, because remember, just barely passing all of the assignments, usually a C, would result in 100% complete. Just barely being under that standard for the whole semester, traditionally maybe a D, is smart, it would look like a zero. So it's not a traditional grade at all. I didn't retain any editorial power over those grades whatsoever. I feel like if they met that standard, I'm OK with them passing, and I think grades are meaningless. So they can probably come up with something just as meaningful as I can. I didn't do this. I didn't make a good plan for the people who didn't meet that standard, because I was like, why would you do that? <laughs> That's not going to be a problem. It was a problem. <laughs> and I think in the future, I'll say, if you didn't meet that 75% all the way across, you can also name your own grade as long as it's just a D or an F. <laughs> Which in the music department doesn't allow you go to go on to the next course in the sequence, because they haven't completed the work necessary to do that. 
That brings the pass-fail policy to the course level. I decide, do they pass or not? And they decide the grade. My biggest struggle in actually implementing all of this was keeping students on track. My official policies, again, allowed almost all work to be resubmitted within a week of being graded, but turns out Canvas doesn't do a really good job of communicating stuff like that. As soon as you mark it incomplete, Canvas is like, you're done with that. <laughs> and it doesn't show up for them anymore. I wish there was some way to keep that active on to-do lists and things like that. I will be better about communicating about that. Also, I tend to be very uh, understanding about mental health issues. So in practice, I accepted a lot of resubmissions past my official deadlines. Um, in, in the future, I think I'll need to be a little bit more strict about that, uh, about that policy. And clearly communicate, if somebody didn't meet the standard, what exactly do you need to fix to turn that into a complete? Because sometimes we get locked into these cycles of resubmission, feedback, resubmission, feedback that didn't need to be as long as they were. When I asked students on their course evaluations how these policies affected them in their learning, all but three students said positively, and two said neutral. Just one negative. I asked them to explain in prose, and I got a lot of extremely positive general comments. But there are some specific things I really care about, and I pulled out some comments related to that. One is the focus on learning and not a grade. That's one of the biggest benefits of ungrading. My students lear reported more focus on, on learning and less on strategy. This system made it more about learning than about grades. And coming from someone who is all about getting good grades, it helped me focus on actually learning. So some of our A students might do better at learning in this system. Second, many students talked about lowered stress or improved mental health. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm seeing way more problems in my students' uh, mental health than I have in past years. And so that was very important to me this year. For example, it helped me during a tough semester health-wise to realize that even though I may not be perfect, I was learning. And that was enough. That was really heartening to me. There were those three students who didn't think it was so positive. Um, one of them said, discouraged me from trying super hard or coming to class. That was the only person who mentioned a decreased motivation. That was one thing I was worried about, that people would feel less motivation to keep up with things. That was the only comment that mentioned it. More important, one, one student did get locked into those cycles of resubmissions and felt like they were never good enough. And I need to do a better job of communicating to students with like that, meeting with them. Sometimes just saying, we're declaring bankruptcy on this one. We're moving forward <laughs> on the other assignments. OK. So um, oh, right. So we took out the QR code here. But I just want to mention again, my slides are available at that QR code. So, are, so is my final self-reflection, which I think is too wordy. So maybe that's not so useful. But also that infographic, in case you find that interesting. OK, um, so happy to be here. Um, thank you all for filling the room. Very exciting. Um, so I'm going to talk very quickly about a specific strategy that I implemented in my class in the spring, um, taking inspiration from our ungrading group in the fall, um, and talk about a, a self-assessment portfolio assignment that I had my students do, um, in which they were not graded throughout the entire semester. Um, they were given extensive feedback, um, but no numerical grade. So my gradebook looked a lot like Tim's that you just saw. Um, and at the end of the semester, they were responsible for compiling all of their work, creating a portfolio, and then a, giving themselves a grade uh, using that portfolio as evidence. Um, and so in this very short talk, I'm going to quickly touch on some of the negative ramifications of grades. We've heard a lot about that already today, so I won't linger. Um, what, how the portfolio assignment ameliorates those, what that actually looks like, and then some of the feedback. Um, so we you know, have already talked about this a lot. And if you, if you read the ungrading book, this is a lot of the kind of uh, takeaways and outcomes. But these, these points also come directly from my student feedback. I, one of the benefits of the portfolio is that students are commenting and reflecting on everything that they turn in, which gives me ample opportunity to learn more about how my assignments read to them, what they're thinking, what was challenging or, or easy, um, and other things. I get kind of glimpses into their lives. So uh, the two that I'm going to fo focus on the most is that uh, grades have the opportunity or can have the effect of, like we were already talking about, having students wrap their self-worth up in their grade. Um, that getting less than an A means that they have failed as a human being. 
Um, and then the, sec the other one I'm going to focus on the most is this idea of uh, guessing what the teacher's thinking in a way that asks students to conform to standards that usually they don't know, um, might not have access to, might not agree with. Um, and ultimately what we're teaching them uh, is to conform and to conform to us. Um, and in my field, I'm in English, uh, one of the biggest uh, outcomes or goals I have in my class is getting students to think critically. Um, and I find it hard to square that um, with grades sometimes. So for, and this is again taking from my students, uh, I'll read this quickly. Initially, this is taken from my portfolio, so this is feedback after the semester. Initially, this very different classroom structure was hard for me to adjust to. I'm a perfectionist student who loves to base all my self-worth on grades. Being wrong wasn't really a concept in this class, which meant there wasn't just one way to be right. I honestly struggled with that because I know I have a knack for figuring out the right way to work a class. And it's that working a class that I was like, oh, God. Um, <laughs> with so many possibilities, I had to figure out my own answers instead of just trying to figure out what the teacher wanted. After a few weeks, I finally realized there wasn't a need to finesse the system again. Free of conventional grades and assignments, I could just participate authentically and safely. Um, so the portfolio itself, I mentioned a little bit already what it looked like, but my students are, um, the, I'm, I teach English and so writing is a huge component of my class. I have students do a written assignment, um, one to two pages pretty much every week, um, but I don't, because none of it is graded, I don't have a late policy. Um, and I don't even really have a submission policy. So students are given perhaps more work than they can do and are asked to make their choices about what work seems um, important to do throughout the semester and then to kind of deal with those choices at the end. Um, but like Julie mentioned before, all of the work that I do is scaffold. So it's scaffolded. So if you miss one, it's really hard to catch up unless you kind of go back and do it. So for example, I'll have a one assignment where a student has to define a key term. The next assignment takes that key term and asks them to apply it to something. The next assignment takes that application and asks them to put it into context with research. The next assignment asks them to take that research and da, 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 so on and on and on. So missing an assignment is not punished. Uh, numerically, but it is pun they are missing out on a key part of the thing, and they know that, and so then they, they do it, mostly. Um, and then using, the, so they compile this portfolio, and then they use the portfolio to advocate for a grade for themselves using um, the work that they did as evidence for, um, for that grade. And again, the goals of this are really to get students to think of themselves as, in this holistic way. And one of the things that can happen, I think, in my experience too with grades is that the expectation is that they're at 100%, right? And that everything that they do that's not perfect is, is a downgrade. So if you get a B on the first assignment, you can never get a full 100% in the class anymore. You've lost that opportunity. So in this case, instead, students are encouraged, like Julie was saying, to fail productively, fail forward. You can't, you're not gonna be perfect at the beginning of the semester. And so one of the most important parts of the portfolio is asking students to really evaluate where they were at the beginning of the semester and where they are at the end. So when I introduce the portfolio assignment to my students, I tell them the thing you're trying to prove with this is growth. How did you grow? How have you changed? Um, and that way, the failed assignments, failed assignments at the beginning are actually useful to them. They want those. They want the work that was rough so that they can show that they got better. Um, and so being able to have that work uh, that might have gotten them a C, and then they're like, well, I'm never going to look at that again because I can't believe I got a C on it, now becomes a really valuable piece of their growth um, throughout the semester. Um, so this is what this looks like on Canvas. I have my uh, assignment sheet in the box folder that you'll get. Um, and this is the worksheet I gave them. So I also had a lot of students who were very anxious about this and wanted a more quantitative way to think about their grade. So I created a, a worksheet that kind of enabled them to do that. Um, and this is also in that box folder. Uh, one of the big concerns I had with this is that everyone would give themselves an A. Uh, that was not my experience at all. In fact, I had many, many students who gave themselves uh, a grade much lower than I would have given them myself. Um, and so in those cases, I, I boosted those, those up a little bit. Um, but the thing that I find really important about these is that they, in both cases, didn't give, I mean, one gave A minus, but 
not, not a perfect score, and then a B. And in both cases, they still talk about feeling very proud of themselves, proud of their work, proud that they made it to the end of the semester, proud that they could turn in this portfolio, even though they know it's on an A. Um, and so some of the other things is, well, I'm, I'm just going to skip this. Okay. Um, one of the takeaways for me from ungrading, very, very similar to what Tim said. I saw such an improvement on students wanting to learn for the sake of learning and being excited that they were not being held to a standard they didn't understand. Um, and also real improvement in mental health, um, or maybe not improvement in mental health, but they were able to acknowledge how the class interacted with their mental health in ways that were not detrimental, um, which I think is kind of the best we can uh, hope for. So, but this last one I want to read a little bit of because I like the energy so much. Um, as I discovered while researching my topic, having that ability to choose, even if the consequence isn't necessarily rewarding, it is in and of itself rewarding. Seeing my idea actually materialize in front of me made me feel like I was really capable of doing new and challenging things. I felt extremely accomplished in a way I never had before because not only had I completed the assignment, but I created a new way to complete the assignment and it worked. This is something I'm really excited about. <laughs> um, so yeah, some of these takeaways are uh, the degree of metacognition and reflection that students are asked to do, I think really help them think of themselves in this more holistic way and think of the semester as this kind of uh, project that occurs over time, um, feeling proud of themselves, learning to self-advocate. I had so many students be like, what if I give myself a better grade than you would give me? And I was like, yeah, do it, you know, like <laughs> stand up for yourself, and, uh, <laughs> which I find really powerful, you know. Um, and then this, similar to what Julie was saying, that the grade becomes so much more of a conversation than a ruling um, and that students get excited to learn for the sake of learning. So. Okay, so my colleagues have done a fantastic job talking about the why. Why did we join this rebellion and give up on grading? And they've also shown you how, what that looks like in their classrooms. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the how and then reinforce the why. Um, for me, this began um, before I came to USU. I actually taught ESL, or English as a second, and additional language. And here was where I saw the magic happening. I saw learning taking place without students being incentivized by a traditional grade. Um, my students, they worked full-time jobs. They had families. They had all these demands that our college students have, and yet they came hungry to learn English. And it was all about the English. It wasn't about the points. So when I came to USU, I knew that this would work. And here at USU, I am a learning specialist and I teach habits of mind courses. These two that are highlighted are ones that I decided to go ungrading in. But I had the luxury of at the same time teaching them in an ungrading way, teaching them with grades. So I could compare the results side by side. And it was pretty powerful what I discovered. So I first participated in a learning circle where we read Susan Bloom's book, Ungrading. During that time was when I put this into action. I have the luxury of teaching a lot of seven week courses, so that meant I got to do ungrading multiple times in the same semester. And so that allowed me to modify. By the time we got to spring, I realized some things were working, some things weren't. One of the things that was really working was meeting with my students one on one. Something that was problematic, the first go at it, I only met with them once one on one. And that was the discussion where we determined their grade. You can imagine how intimidating that was for my students. And so I took their feedback and decided, you know what, I got to carve more time out of the schedule. I need to meet with them multiple times. This means at the beginning of the class. This means checking in in the middle of the class and again at the end. And they really responded well to that, and I did too. Um, that way, it wasn't a mystery where they stood in the class and how they were progressing. Over the summer, I started reading Grading Justice. We're going to have the nice treat of having um, Kristen Blind come to USU in January. And I'll be leading a learning circle if anyone wants to nerd out on ungrading with me. Um, during the summer, as I participated in another learning circle that was ungrading 2.0, I realized a lot of our USU colleagues are doing this, and we're all doing it differently, which ungrading lends itself to be done in alternative approaches. Um, what I liked that we kind of coined was collaborative grading. I think initially I saw ungrading as I'm not giving students a grade, students give themselves a grade. But really, that's also kind of problematic, if I'm being honest. I do kind of like to be a gatekeeper in some senses. And so collaboration is how I help students acquire the metacognition that they need to accurately self-assess themselves, and we both feel good about their grade. So I also had this big aha moment. 
I think the whole time that I have been a part of this rebellion, I've thought, grades are awful. I hate them. Let's get rid of them. But I realized that would be a really huge undertaking institutionally for this to go away. And I realized that grades are not the villain. The problem is we're hyper-focused on grades, all of us, students, instructors included. And that takes away from student learning. And so for me, the takeaways of ungrading have been monumental. They've changed the way that I teach. And here are some of those things. I've talked about how important meeting with your students one-on-one. -on -one. Even if you teach online asynchronous courses, I do, you can get those folks on Zoom, and it will make a big difference in their engagement in your courses. Um, resubmissions, this is really important, right? We shouldn't have an expectation that our students are going to be perfect from the get-go. Allowing them to fail and have a safe space to fail and then learn from their failure is how they're going to learn. So let them do assignments again. In my class, they have to turn it in on time to get this right to do it over again. But if they turn it in on time, they can do it as many times as they want according to my feedback until they get it where we both want it. Um, feedback is huge. Honestly, just having a conversation about this game of school. We don't talk about it, um, but it, it's occurring, right? Where we have students that are chasing grades, but they like cram, and then after the test, they've retained nothing, and then they don't have this understanding, and when they leave USU, do they have these habits of mind that are gonna help them throughout their life and professions? Maybe not. So it's really important that we talk about the game of school, and we make sure that we're not playing the game of school, but that we're focused on learning. Give students choices. Um, definitely seek learner input along the way and ultimately give ownership back to your students. The responsibility of their learning, it's not just on us, it's not really on us, it's on them. So invite them to take that ownership and give up authority where possible. We want to have time for questions, so this next slide shows our QR code. Um, definitely check out our resources. We've all stuck our syllabi, we've stuck a lot of helpful stuff in there, and I think all of us would agree, reach out to us. We love to talk about this, we're nerds on it. So. If anyone has questions, now's the time if you want to join the rebellion or just maybe critique us as far as why we're rebels. <laughs> I'll maybe stand yeah. So do you have data to show that this is effective? Because everything that you have up there for like meeting with the students more, you can do that with grading or ungrading. Is there any data that shows that it's significantly different, that there is a, not just perceived, I learned so much, but an actual, you know, quantitative, you know, result that says this actually is more effective, but then you can't because it's ungrading, so you can't actually test a, 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 an amount of knowledge. So how do you actually know if it's effective or if it's just self-analysis? So the question was, um, how, how can we separate out grade, ungrading from the other things that we're doing, especially since ungrading may make it hard to quantify how much learning is happening? I think there's a big assumption there, which is that grades represent learning. And I'm not sure that's true. In many cases, that knowledge may be pre-existing, or it could mean all kinds of different things. Um, so that was the one thing I wanted to say. I'm sure everybody wants to say something on this. So <laughs> gonna, I'll pass it on. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly jump in. I'm a qualitative researcher, so like, um, a lot of that idea of quantification is great, but also I saw a very distinct line in the sand from students that I had graded traditionally in this same course to the cohort that came through and their work exponentially being better than the previous cohort. Like they're gonna have a real good time going through matriculation because it's gonna be competitive. Just echoing what Tim says, I think all of us are up here because we don't believe grades measure learning. And so, yeah, that's why most of our results, as you've seen, have been student-based comments, their experience with it. And, and actually, I should say, I, I actually did preserve some quizzes in my class. Um, and those you know, individual quizzes did measure learning on specific topics. Um, I made them repeatable. Um, and those were the few assignments that were not complete incomplete because I was like, well, if they got 19 out of 20 on that, well, I guess they're 19% or not 19% complete, 19 out of 20 complete. Um, and so I just let that factor into their completion grades. So there were, there were measurements, uh, direct measurements of learning that were factored into the grade as well. I'm, I'm not 100% sure that my students actually learned more than other students. I'm pretty sure they didn't learn less. And I liked the way they approached learning at the end of the class. Just, I just one caveat, of course, anything that's creative, this sounds perfect. You know, 
um, English and art and music, like that's very creative and, and very subjective. But you know, I'm science based, so we have this pool of you need to know this. But yeah, anything that's creative, I think this would be great. I, I'm actually glad that you said that because my biggest uh, group of critics always come from STEM. But I like that because it's true. We have to have results, right? We have to have standards. But I think when you look at um, people in the industry after college, they're not getting graded, but they still have standards. So I just want to maybe iterate something that I didn't when I was talking earlier that assessment is still a part of the game, right? You can't have learning without assessment. Feedback still part of the game. Standards still part of the game. We're just getting away from F to A, getting away from one, two, three, four, right? We're not crunching numbers. We're helping them see the value in what they're doing and then helping those standards. Like a complete or an incomplete, if it's not to standard, it's incomplete. In my class, I was kind of harsher. C's didn't benefit. They had to have an A to be complete. So a lot of people said, you're being too picky, way too picky. And I said, well, the standard's an A in this class if you want complete. Just a comment, you got, you, you're reading this book, or you've read this book, and I, I've read part of it, and it says that Yale and a couple of other big-time Ivy League schools have adopted this in some of their lower division classes. Is that right? Which would be science-based. Um, Brown University doesn't do grades, and then the editor of the book was from Notre Dame, but I don't know specifically about Yale. I'm a clinical instructor, so I'm working with students who are working with other clients. So we have a lot of like medical documentation that's going back and forth, sometimes two, three times a week. But the thing that I found that, and I don't know what if you have any suggestions, is like I give them to say that we're going to have lots of feedback, and then their first submission just isn't that great because they know there's going to be feedback. Do you have any suggestions of how to like approach that with students and that I can encourage their best work that first time, knowing that I don't expect it to be perfect? Um, especially it's a brand new document that they've never had to write, but they're writing multiple times a week, and I'm editing multiple times a week with a lot of students. <laughs> So one suggestion for something like that would be to like you still have your rubrics, you still have, you know, the standards and objectives that you have to reach, and you can still mark on that rubric. There's just not point allocation associated with that, and then you leave room for that feedback and comment section for each section of that rubric. So yes, you met that. This is excellent. This is excellent. This needs work specifically here, and they're going to try and meet all of those expectations on the rubric, but that rubric has no quantifiable slide scale. Does that make sense? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. How do you come up with that rubric? I guess, is it just specific to I mean, the assignment and your assignment? Do you have this, like, we use like a one to five scale, which has a number, which then is a grade. And, and the students average it out, you know, they figure out what they got. And so do you suggest taking that number? I mean, they all know the number. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And mm -hmm. just, just take the number out. Giving it a title. different title. Mm -hmm. like, uh, one thing that I do, I don't know if this would work on the first assignment, but something that I found was really helpful is having students come up with their own rubric by saying, like, these are, you know, these are the objectives of the assignment. How would you parse the distinction between excellent and okay? Um, and having them to try to articulate that gets that they hate it. They, are, they hate it so much. Um, but being able to really parse those distinctions, I think, gets them to start thinking about, like, the difference between an A and a B is not some arbitrary number, but, like, five or four. It's, like, the, these qualities of thing. Um, and so having the students have to name those uh, can be really powerful for them to then be like, am I meeting my own standards? And then I have a lot of students greet each other based on their own rubrics, and so then the students are receiving feedback in that way. And one thing I think you could do for the first assignment is to include a reflection too, where it's like, how well do you think you did on this? Or like, what was challenging about this assignment? Or like, if you had more time, what would you do again to get students to be thinking about the quality of their work without just putting it on you to fix it, essentially? Yeah, that's how I felt. Like, yeah. just kind of creatively thinking here I, you could also say to be able to resubmit you have to do these things this information has to be there because otherwise I'm not seeing that you're invested in this process or something like that um, just a just a thought or there's also I mean this is an ideological thing but you could just say okay I've seen that their first work is always not up to standard I am going to plan that into my class and therefore, that the first assignment is going to be what it is, but then I'm going to have another assignment where I'm like, okay, now really do it, or something like that. 
That's what I was going to add. In my experience, your original question, the problem fixes itself over time. Because just like we don't want to go and grade an assignment seven times, the student doesn't want to do one assignment seven times. So if they keep getting it marked incomplete, they're going to start to be more cautious and conscientious before they submit it, which is an end win for all of us.